Book of Heaven, Volume 11, Part 10 October 1914 Value and effects of the hours of the Passion and recompense that Jesus shall give to those who do them. I was writing the hours of the Passion and I thought to myself, how many sacrifices in order to write these blessed hours of the Passion, especially to put on paper certain interior acts that had passed only between me and Jesus. What shall be the recompense that he shall give to me? And Jesus, letting me hear his tender and sweet voice, told me, My daughter, as recompense for having written the hours of my passion, for each word you have written, I shall give you a kiss and a soul. And I, my love, this is for me, and what shall you give to those who shall do them? And Jesus, if they do them together with me and with my own will, I shall also give them a soul for each word they shall recite, because the greater or lesser effectiveness of these hours of my passion is in the greater or lesser union that they have with me. By doing them with my will, the creature hides within my volition, and since it is my volition that acts, I can produce all the goods I want even through one word alone. And this for each time you shall do them. Another time I was lamenting to Jesus, because after so many sacrifices to write these hours of the Passion, very few were the souls who were doing them. And he, My daughter, do not lament, even if there were only one. You should be content. Would I not have suffered my whole passion, even if one soul alone were to be saved? The same for you. One should never omit good, because few avail themselves of it. All the harm is for those who do not take advantage of it. And just as my passion made my humanity acquire the merit as if all were saved, even though not all are saved, because my will was to save everyone. And I received merit according to what I wanted, not according to the profit that creatures would draw. The same for you. You shall be rewarded depending on whether your will was identified with my will in wanting to do good to all. All the harm is for those who, though being able to, do not do them. These hours are the most precious of all, because they are nothing less than the repetition of what I did in the course of my mortal life, and what I continue to do in the Most Holy Sacrament. When I hear these hours of my passion, I hear my own voice my own prayers. In that soul, I see my will, that is, wanting the good of all and repairing for all. And I feel drawn to dwell in her, to be able to do what she herself does within her. Oh, how I would love that even one single soul for each town did these hours of my passion. I would hear myself in each town, and my justice, greatly indignant during these times, would be placated in part. I add that one day I was doing the hour in which the celestial mamma gave burial to Jesus, and I followed her to keep her company in her bitter desolation, to compassionate her. I did not usually do this hour all the times, only sometimes. 
Now I was undecided about whether I should do it or not. And blessed Jesus, all love, and as though praying me, told me, My daughter, I do not want you to omit it. You shall do it for love of me, in honor of my mamma. Know that every time you do it, my mamma feels as if she were on earth in person, repeating her life, and therefore she receives that glory and love that she gave me while on earth. And I feel as if my mamma were on earth again. Her maternal tenderness, her love, and all the glory that she gave me. So I shall consider you as a mother. Then as he embraced me, I heard him say to me very softly, My mamma, mamma. And he whispered to me all that sweet mamma did and suffered in this hour. And I followed her. From that time on, helped by his grace, I have never omitted it again. October 29th, 1914. The acts united with the will of God are complete and perfect acts. I was lamenting to blessed Jesus because of his privations, and my poor heart, oppressed, was in delirium. Speaking nonsense, I said to him, My love, how can this be? Have you forgotten that I don't know how, nor can I be without you? Either with you on earth or with you in heaven, do you perhaps want me to remind you of this? Do you want to be silent, asleep, troubled? Then do so, as long as you remain always with me. But I feel that you have put me out of your heart. Ah, did you have the heart to do this? But as I was saying this and other nonsense, my sweet Jesus moving in my interior told me, My daughter, calm down. I am here. To say that I have put you out of my heart is an insult that you give me. When I keep you in the depth of my heart, and so tightly, that my whole being flows in you, and yours in me. Therefore be attentive so that nothing of my being that flows within you may escape you, and that each one of your acts may be united with my will. In fact, my will contains completely accomplished acts. One single act of my will is enough to create a thousand worlds, all perfect and complete. I do not need subsequent acts. One is enough for all. So in doing the simplest act united with my will, you shall give me a complete act, that is, an act of love, of praise, of thanksgiving, of reparation. In sum, you shall enclose for me everything in this act. Even more, you shall enclose even myself, and shall give myself to me. Ah, uh, yes, only these acts united with my will can stand before me, because with a perfect being who does not know how to do incomplete acts, it takes complete and perfect acts to give him honor and satisfaction. And only in my will shall the creature find these complete and perfect acts. Outside of my will, no matter how good her acts might be, they shall always be imperfect and incomplete, because the creature needs subsequent acts in order to complete and perfect a work, if she manages at all. Therefore, all that the creature does outside of my will, 
I look on as a trifle. So may my will be your life, your regime, your all. In this way, by enclosing my will, you shall be in me, and I in you. And you shall be very careful not to say ever again that I have put you out of my heart. November 4th, 1914. The Satisfaction of Jesus because of the Hours of the Passion. I was doing the Hours of the Passion, and Jesus, all pleased, told me, My daughter, if you knew what great satisfaction I feel in seeing you repeating these Hours of my Passion, always repeating them, over and over again, you would be happy. It is true that my saints have meditated on my passion and have comprehended how much I suffered, melting in tears of compassion, so much so as to feel consumed for love of my pains, but not in such a continuous way, and repeated many times in this order. Therefore I can say, that you are the first one to give me this pleasure, so great and special, as you keep fragmenting within you, hour by hour, my life and what I suffered. And I feel so drawn that hour by hour, I give you this food, and I eat the same food with you, doing what you do together with you. No, however, that I shall reward you abundantly with new light and new graces. And even after your death, each time souls on earth shall do these hours of my passion, in heaven I shall clothe you with ever new light and glory. November 6, 1914. The soul who does the hours of the passion makes the life of Jesus her own and does his same office. As I continued the usual hours of the Passion, my lovable Jesus told me, My daughter, the world is in continuous act of renewing my Passion, and since my immensity envelops everything inside and outside the creatures, from their contact I am forced to receive nails, thorns, scourges, scorns, spit, and all the rest that I suffered in the Passion, and still more. Now, at the contact with souls who do these hours of my Passion, I feel the nails being removed, the thorns shattered, the wounds soothed the spit taken away. I feel I am repaid in good for the evil that others do to me, and in feeling that their contact does no harm to me but good, I lean more and more on them. In addition to this, returning to speak about these hours of the Passion, Blessed Jesus said, My daughter, know that by doing these hours, the soul takes my thoughts and makes them her own. She takes my reparations, prayers, desires, affections, and even my most intimate fibers, and makes them her own. And rising up between heaven and earth, she does my same office. And as co-redemptrix, she says with me, Echego. Me. meaning, here I am, send me. I want to repair for all, answer for all, and imitate good for all. November 20th, 1914, Necessity of Writing About the Chastisements The Divine Will and Love Form the life and the passion of Jesus in the soul. 
I was feeling very afflicted because of the pervasions of blessed Jesus, and much more so because of the scourges that are currently pouring down upon earth, and about which many times Jesus had spoken to me many years before. It really seems to me that during so many years in which he has kept me in bed, we would share the weight of the world, suffering and working together for the good of all creatures. It seems to me that the state of victim in which lovable Jesus had placed me bound all creatures together between him and me. There was nothing that Jesus would do nor chastisement he would send without letting me know. And I would plead so much before him that he would either reduce the chastisement by half or not send it at all. Oh, how I grieve at the thought that Jesus might have withdrawn all the weight of creatures upon himself, leaving me aside as unworthy to work together with him. But there are yet more afflictions. In the darting little visits that Jesus makes, he keeps telling me that the wars and the scourges that are happening now are still nothing. Well, it seems that they are too much, that other nations shall go to war, and not only this, but that, in time, they shall wage wars against the church, attack sacred people and kill them. How many churches shall be profaned? In truth, for about two years I have omitted writing about the chastisements, which very often Jesus manifested to me, partly because they are repetitions, and partly because writing about chastisements hurts me so much that I just cannot continue. However, one evening, while I was writing what he had told me about his most holy will, and having skipped what he had told me about the chastisements, Reproaching me sweetly, Jesus told me, Why did you not write everything? And I, my love, it did not seem necessary to me. And besides, you know how much I suffer. And Jesus, my daughter, if it were not necessary, I would not have told you. And besides, since your state of victim is linked with the events that my providence disposes over creatures, and since this link between you, myself, and creatures, as well as your sufferings, in order to prevent chastisements, appear from your writings, this gap would be noticed, and things would appear as clashing and incomplete. And I do not know how to do clashing and incomplete things. Shrugging my shoulders, I said, It is too hard for me to do it. And besides, who is going to remember everything? And Jesus, smiling, added, And if after your death I put a pen of fire in your hands, in purgatory, what shall you say? So that's why I made up my mind to mention the chastisements. I hope that Jesus shall forgive my omission, and I promise to be more diligent in the future. Now I go back to say that as I was very afflicted, on coming, Jesus took me in his arms to cheer me and told me, My daughter, be cheered. The one who does my will is never apart from me. Rather, she is together with me in the works that I do, in my desires, in my love. She is together with me in everything and everywhere. Even more, I can say that since I want everything for myself, affections, desires, and so forth of all creatures, 
but I do not have them. I remain around the creatures with the attitude of making a conquest. Now, as I find the satisfaction of my desires in the one who does my will, my desire rests in her. My love takes rest in her love, and so with all the rest. Then he added, I have given you two very great things that one can say formed my very life. My life was enclosed in these two points, divine will and love. And this will carried out my life in me and accomplished my passion. I want nothing else from you but that my will be your life, your rule, and that in not one thing, whether small or big, you escape from it. This will shall carry out my passion in you, and the closer you remain to my will, the more you shall feel my passion within you. If you let my will flow as life within you, my will shall make my passion flow within you. So you shall feel it flowing in each one of your thoughts, in your mouth. You shall feel your tongue soaked in it. And your word shall come out warm with my blood. And you shall speak eloquently about my pains. Your heart shall be filled with my pains. And in each of its outpourings, it shall bring the mark of my passion to your whole being. And I shall keep repeating to you always, Here is my life. Here is my life. I shall delight in giving you surprises, narrating to you now one pain, now another, that you have not yet heard or understood. Aren't you happy? December 17, 1914 The divine will forms the true and perfect consecration of the divine life in the soul. Continuing in my usual state and being very afflicted because of the privations of Jesus, after many hardships he came, making himself seen in all of my poor being. It seemed to me as if I were the garment of Jesus. Then, breaking the silence, he told me, My daughter, you too can form hosts and consecrate them. Do you see the garment that covers me in the sacrament? These are the accidents of the bread with which the host is formed. The life that exists in this host is my body, my blood, and my divinity. The attitude that contains this life is my supreme will, and this will carries out the love, the reparation, the immolation, and all the rest that I do in the sacrament that never moves one point from my volition. There is nothing that comes from me that is not led by my volition. Here is how you two can form the host. The host is material and totally human. You too have a material body and a human will. This body and this will of yours, if you keep them pure, upright, and far away from any shadow of sin are the accidents, the veils, so that I may be able to consecrate myself and live hidden within you. But this is not enough. It would be like the host without consecration. My life is needed. My life is composed of sanctity, of love, of wisdom, of power, and so forth. But the engine of all is my will. 
Therefore, after you have prepared the host, you must make your will die in this host. You must cook it well, so that it may not be born again. Then you must let my will permeate all your being, and my will that contains the whole of my life shall form the true and perfect consecration. So the human thought shall have life no more, but only the thought of my volition. And this consecration shall create my wisdom in your mind. No more life for what is human, for weakness, for inconstancy, because my will shall form the consecration of the divine life, of fortitude, of firmness, and of all that I am. So, each time you make your will, your desires, and all that you are and that you may do, flow into my will, I shall renew the consecration, and I shall continue my life within you, as in a living host, not a dead one like the hosts without me. But this is not all. In the consecrated hosts, in the pyxes, in the tabernacles, everything is dead, mute, not a heartbeat sensibly, not a surge of love that may correspond to so much love of mine. If it wasn't for the fact that I wait for hearts in order to give myself to them, I would be quite unhappy. I would remain defrauded in my love, and my sacramental life would remain without purpose. And if I tolerate this in the tabernacles, I would not tolerate it in living hosts. So, life needs nourishment, and in the sacrament I want to be nourished, and I want to be nourished with my own food. That is, the soul shall make my will, my love, my prayers, reparations, and sacrifices her own. She shall give them to me as if they were her own things, and I shall nourish myself. The soul shall unite with me. She shall prick up her ears to hear what I am doing, so as to do it together with me. And as she keeps repeating my own acts, she shall give me her food, and I shall be happy. Only in these living hosts Shall I find the compensation for the loneliness, the starvation, and all that I suffer in the tabernacles? December 21st, 1914 To have company in his pains is the greatest relief for Jesus. I was in my usual state, and blessed Jesus, coming all afflicted, told me, my daughter, I can take the world no more. You, relieve me for all. Let me palpitate in your heart, so that in feeling the heartbeats of all through your heart, sins may not reach me directly, but indirectly, through your heart. Otherwise my justice shall put out all the chastisements that have never occurred before. And in the act of saying this, he identified his heart with mine and made me feel his heartbeat. But who can say what I could feel? Sins, like arrows, wounded that heart. And as I shared in it, Jesus would find relief. Then, feeling all identified with him, I seemed to be enclosing his intelligence his hands, his feet, and all the rest. And I shared in all the offenses of each of the senses of creatures. But who can say how this was happening? Then Jesus added, To have company in my pains 
is the greatest relief for me. This is why my Divine Father was not so inexorable after my incarnation, but milder, because he no longer received offenses directly, but indirectly. That is, through my humanity, that acted as a continuous shield for him. In the same way, I keep searching for souls who would place themselves between me and the creatures. Otherwise, I shall make of the world a heap of ruins. You have reached the end of the Book of Heaven, Volume 11, Part 10. Fiat.